Wonderful. Great to be in church this morning, isn't it? <laughs> so good to see you all. Um, <clears throat> this morning I'm wanting to continue with uh, just, it's almost like Christianity 101 as I um, begin to just kind of reflect into the future. And it's, so, you know, often people say, oh, we're in a season in church. And that season is relative to how long that season is going to be. Seasons in church are very, it's very difficult to determine how long a season is. And I've come to realize it's very difficult to determine how long a preaching series should be. Because quite often in the middle of the series, you just feel, oops, something else has been dropped in. And uh, it's almost like interrupted where we thought we were going and God just begins to change course. And I do feel this morning, just to let you know where we're going as a church. Um, I do feel to continue to lay the foundation that I have been laying, and it's all because in our own hearts we need to be convinced of this gospel that we embrace. Each one of us uh, at any given point in our lives should at least be able to give an account of the hope that we have in us. Now, that's Bible language, but in kind of regular colloquial speech, it should just mean that you and I are able to argue the point of why we are believers. Um, and if ever the church needs to be able to do that, well then of course it's today because of the incredible t attack against the, the values of the church. An incredible attack against the, can I just say, the Christian view that we hold, which we would see as a worldview that we carry into our daily living. And this is what we express by lifestyle, by example. And we really need to have a good example in the world today because we've been questioned. Uh, and uh, the devil makes a point of questioning the church. He did that with Jesus when Jesus was in the wilderness. Uh, he started off by saying, well, if you are the son of God. So the very way that he introduced that question with simply saying, well, if you are, would suggest great elements of doubt. There are many who don't think you are Jesus and I certainly don't think you are, although he knew who Jesus was. And so the devil will always try and put doubt on the church. He will always try and put us in a place where we look like we've blurred and smudged the name of Jesus. And to a degree, we do that sometimes, and we are quite successful at that. But there is a call from heaven to say, come on church, stand up, um, <clears throat> and give an account of yourselves by virtue of your testimony and also by virtue of what it is that you know that you stand for. And so it really comes down to Christianity 101. It comes down to the basics of salvation. It comes down to what it was that Jesus began to preach when he started preaching. It was the message of the kingdom. It was the message that John the baptizer came along and he said, you have to repent. He was shaking the mindset of the people that he was speaking to, which were the Jewish people. And traditionally, they basically felt they had a one-way ticket to heaven. Well, after all, we the sons and daughters of Abraham. And if you're a son and daughter of Abraham, well, then you carry the promises of Abraham. And so, of course, they saw themselves as elite. And so from a point of view that God chose them as a group, a cultural group to, through which his savior to the world was going to be born, well, that does make them special. And as Christians, we do need to pray for the Jewish people. We do need to do that. The Bible instructs us, instructs us to do that. But I do feel that for us as Christians today, we should be able to give a reason why we feel being born again is essential to eternal life and not any other way. Not all roads lead to Rome. And so this morning, I'm gonna pick up on the text in Acts chapter two and verse 38. I'm gonna speak specifically about the subject of baptism. Now in itself, it's a series. In itself, we could probably go for 12 weeks just on the subject of baptism. But what I'm gonna do is just at least begin to whet our appetites about what it is that we believe about baptism. What it is that the Christian church preached. Tragically, over the years, when the church institutionalized itself, which wasn't long, after Jesus had ascended into heaven, you had the church step into a zone of great passion, step into a zone of great excitement, step into a zone of great relevance. And the Bible describes that thousands of people were being added to the church. But oh my goodness, it was less than a hundred years later when you begin to see letters that are being written to the church describing to them how they have become distracted and they've lost their plumb line of truth and they're now beginning to follow their own way. And that's very sad because it happened quite quickly. It just shows you the heart of man. 
And within 100 years, within 200 years, and with 300 years, suddenly now the church was institutionalized, meaning simply that there was an authority person and the church became quite hierarchical and very autocratic in its nature. And the moment it did that, it began to move away from scripture. And so people were becoming, let me say, constitutionally correct, but biblically incorrect. And so what happens when you become constitutionally correct or where you take what you perceive to be truth and you put it into a constitution, then what happens is you begin to dim the light of scripture because scripture then becomes pushed aside and this then becomes the governing dynamic that governs doctrine, that governs what you are to believe. And that's exactly what happened in the life of the church. And so what you needed historically, we know, that Martin Luther got fed up. And so what he does is he goes and he says, look, all this stuff about having to earn your forgiveness is nonsense. The fact that the Roman church at that time had actually instituted a system of indulgences, and that's really what his 95 theses was about. He wrote 95 theses around one subject, and that was that you had to pay for your forgiveness. That's what an indulgence was. And all of the money that was gathered by the indulgences was actually then went towards the building of the great St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. So when you look at that building and you're a tourist, you gotta know that what built that thing was people paying indulgences so that they could get to heaven. Now, of course, for scholars of the Bible, New Testament scholars today, we look back at what Martin Luther wrote and we simply say, thank you very much, Martin Luther, because all you did was just show and expose that actually something had gone horribly wrong with the institutionalized church and they were beginning to speak a doctrine and laying levels of new Christianity, can't really call it Christianity, but new levels of thought in a very ignorant society. And so they held all the power because they were literate. The rest of the communities didn't know how to read or write. And so when you look at that, you just think, well, how sad, because then they began to twist and to contort things to their benefit so that they could build their institution. And so Martin Luther comes along and he writes these 95 the theses, which simply say, you can't do this anymore. This is wrong. In fact, the just, so live by faith. And it's actually the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. And to be forgiven, all we have to do is go and read the scriptures because the scripture was there. The canon of scripture was already in place. That which you and I have in front of us as we call the Bible today was already in place. And so what you have is when it comes to this word baptize, it was dealt a horrible blow. Because had it have been translated we wouldn't have what we have today. Had it have been transliterated, which it was, meaning simply it kept its sound, because the Greek word baptize is baptizo, which means to plunge or to immerse. As an umbrella word then, with that description, plunge <coughs> and immerse, how dare we then fit in sprinkle or pour? Both have different expressions of action. If I sprinkle you with water, you are not being plunged into water. You are not being immersed. If I pour water on you, yeah, a little more effective than sprinkling, but it is still not the word baptizo. And so what happened was the translators and the very first person to translate the Bible into English, well, let's just say the Catholic Bible, was a gentleman called Reverend Bishop Hey, and so let me tell you about this guy. So he is a very interesting figure from a point of view that he becomes one of those that begins to lead in the institutional church. So he's about at least 200 years after Martin Luther. So now you must know the moment Martin Luther writes what he does, there's war in the church. Okay, we were now protesting against what was in place, the Protestants. And so now for a good few hundred years, they're killing each other. I mean, that's a sad part of history is the Catholics are killing the Christians and the Christians are killing the Catholics. I mean, all you have to do is just know your English history and you'll know that to be true. And so what you have is you've got this conflict 
And some never ever dialed into Martin Luther's belief that the just shall live by faith. All right, they didn't. They just stayed on that side of institutionalized church. And this guy, Bishop Hay was, and he's the person that wrote the first English Bible. But now if you know anything about Catholicism, then you will know that there's a lot of their own version of Christianity in their books. And so he writes a book called The Sincere Christian. <laughs> you would think that's a great title. I wanna know what a sincere Christian is about. And so I'm gonna go and read it. But you will find but one of the things that he propagated, I'm gonna read this to you, was um, the words of Aeneas, who uh, happened to visit, he was a Trojan warrior, and what he did is he happened to visit the, the regions of hell. Sorry, I've just got my wrong notes here. I've got the AV notes, I need my preaching notes. All right. So he goes, <laughs> And uh, this Trojan warrior, Aeneas, comes from Greek mythology and Roman mythology. His sad plight, this is what he writes, this is the man who translated out of whatever the Bible was written, and I imagine it was Latin, and he puts it into English. And then he begins to set the tone for much of the doctrine that was then published as being, the Catholic Church means universal church. So as far as he was concerned, he was writing for the universal church. Okay, so he writes this, but he borrows an example of Aeneas, who you will find and read about only in Greek mythology. It says, he had the sad plight when he visited hell to hear the souls of unhappy infants who had died before receiving baptismal rites in the church. So if you had a child, they never got you, you never got your kid baptized, then of course that child went straight to hell. How does that sound? I was hoping to get a better response from that. I thought I'd get like, oh gee, where do they get that from? And it's all because this word baptize was transliterated and not translated. Had it have been translated, and then Bishop Hay himself would have seen, well this means plunge. It doesn't mean sprinkle and it doesn't mean pour. And so even up until that point, many times people sometimes think that actually baptism, all Christians invented that. No, we didn't. In fact, you'll find that um, those who followed the particular mythology or you know, thinking around Isis as being the queen of heaven and Mishra as being one of her counterparts, the goddess of heaven. In fact, if you wanted to be initiated into the rites and the secrets of those two individuals, well, then you had to be baptized. You had to be plunged into water. And then, of course, there are many other factors that go with it. In fact, they took a burning flame, and what they would do is they would go to a bowl of water, and they'd stick the flame in that, and that was to purify the water. And then that was the water that was used for the sprinkling and the pouring and the baptizing. And you can begin to see, but I don't see any of that in Scripture. And so what were they were doing? It just shows me that in this institutionalized church, they had, their hearts had got hard. They weren't even referencing the Bible anymore. They were just preaching now what was beneficial. And then you've got the God, Wooden. That's, we get our word Wednesday from him. Isn't it interesting that every day that we, or when we have a Wednesday, it actually that name is named after this particular God. And so what would happen is if you were to experience a second birth, then you were to be baptized. It was just kind of part of the initiation ceremony to worship the God wooden. And so when you begin to look at all of these practices, and then you go to Mexico and you see, oh my goodness, Mexicans have been baptizing kids forever. And then it was like, if you wanted your child to be cleansed, the symbolism of being cleansed would be, all right, let's take your child to a particular place where we could baptize them, immerse them, sprinkle them or pour water on them. And so this guy who writes sincere Christian, he didn't help matters at all because he decides he's gonna draw from paganism as well and he's gonna bring it into institutionalized church and he's gonna say, if you don't get your kid baptized and he didn't do, they didn't do, even now still today, they don't immerse fully. And so there was the sprinkling and there was this pouring thing. So right now he's off course completely, but because of who he was, this now became established practice and it spilt over into generations that followed. And today we have this word christening. You're not gonna find the expression of christening in the Bible at all. 
It's not there. What you will find though, is that tradition amongst the Jewish people was that they'd bring their children to the temple and there'd be a prophet in the temple. There would be a blessing that would be imparted, but it had nothing to do with water, nothing. And so the blessing would simply be because they understood prophetic words, they understood the promise of God over their children, that's what happened. And so where do we discover that in the New Testament? Well, his parents are bringing their children to Jesus so that he could bless them. What do the disciples do? They get in the way, they stop them and say, no, 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 you can see he's busy. And Jesus said, suffer the little children to come to me because Jesus was interested in giving that child a blessing. And so what you see more space for in scripture is what we do and what countless other, other Christians do is they have their children dedicated. And so we have that on the Sundays that we do. I mean, culturally what we've done is, which you don't find in the Bible, but we've just done this as a cultural thing in terms of just accepting people and the joy and the delight of having a newborn is that we have our little Lion King moments. And I'm pretty sure people, when they have their Lion King moment, they love it. It's an introduction of that new child into the family, but that's not the child's dedication. The dedication follows. We'll be treated very seriously. And we make sure that actually there is a prophetic word for that child to describe their destiny. My three children have been dedicated. My grandchildren have been dedicated. And I've had the good fortune of being at most of those dedications. And I sat and listened with interest to what was being spoken over them. And to this day, I still remember the blessings, particular blessing that was spoken over my children. And today, while they're as old as they are, contributing adults in life, I look back and I just think, thank you God that you set before them a path that Nadine and I could say, you know what? It's up to us to train the child in the way that it should go and they won't depart from it. And all of our children are serving God today. I don't say that as a brag, I say that simply because we followed a biblical process. And so when I look at this text and I see of how it's just been contorted and how things have been construed, it disappoints me because baptism has been dealt a bad blow. Because now today people say, well, yeah, I've been christened, so therefore I don't, well, hold on, I need to correct that because christening, and I speak strongly here, christening is not an expression that you find in the Bible at all. Baptism is. And so you've been incredibly quiet this morning, all right. So there's three dynamics that we're gonna be looking at. And I, I started off by wanting to read Acts chapter two, verse 38. And so there's a text that comes up behind me. I've chosen for purposes of establishing doctrine to read from the Amplified. And Peter answers them, what's the context? Jesus has ascended into heaven. He's told them, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. So they go away and now he's ascended into heaven. And so for 10 days they're fasting and they're praying and they're meeting in an upper room. This particular group in front of me, the number of chairs that we have here is only 120. So there are 120 people in an upper room. It had to have been a room this size, okay? And so it kind of gives us an idea in our minds about how many people there were. And so now they're waiting and they're waiting for this promise that Jesus spoke about, the Holy Spirit. More than once he spoke about it and we'll get to it in a week or two's time. So here I'm reading, it says, he says to them, all right, this happens after that moment because this group of people, in Acts chapter two, it says the Holy Spirit came upon them and something really, really hectic happens. Little tongues of fire come and sit upon each one of their heads. And it says, and they were all filled with what it was that Jesus promised them, the person of the Holy Spirit. And if you're gonna get fire on you, you're gonna feel it, eh? Do you think that was a feeling experience for them? Or was it just entirely mystical? <laughs> Fire burns. You can't tell me that there's a baptism of fire and you don't feel something. Okay, so there's this impartation and it says from within them, they just felt the stirring and it says, and then they began to speak with other tongues as this Holy Spirit gave them the utterance. So who's giving the words? Clearly it's the Holy Spirit, but who's doing the speaking? Well, it's them. And so this moment spills out onto the streets. Big moment because it's the Passover. There are Jews from all over that are there. And so they, what's going on? Jesus, nine o'clock in the morning, these guys are drunk. But hold on a minute, they're actually, what they're saying 
is drawing our attention to the good things and they're speaking good things about God, wow, doesn't really make sense. Because the crowd's gathered, Peter stands up and he says, I know you're asking questions, so let me help you out here. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. This that you see here. We didn't make this up. Prophet, story, this is happening. This is part of that story. This is one of the fulfillments of it. Then he says this to them. You wanna know? Peter answers, he says, repent, change your views and purpose to accept the will of God in your inner selves instead of rejecting it. Now we've already gone through repentance. We've already gone through the being born again experience. And he says, and be baptized. From what I've just spoken about, you would know that right there he's telling you to be plunged into water, to be immersed. Every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness and release from your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In other words, this, what you're seeing, is a promise to you. How do I know that? How do you know that? Well, let's read a little further. It says, for the promise of the Holy Spirit is to you and for you and your children and to those who are far away, even to as many as the Lord our God invites and bids to come to himself. Do you think at any point in that verse, we fit? Do you think we fit in there somewhere? I think it's pretty easy, it's there straightforward. To as many as the Lord our God invites and bids to come to himself. So this is how the first group post Jesus' resurrection, Holy Spirit has now been poured out on the disciples as he said it would happen. They're now stepping out into a public arena and the first command that is given, you want this Christian thing? as Jewish people, those whom Jesus came for, you want this, then this is what you have to do. Emphasis on the word have to, because that's what obedience is. Obedience is compliance with an instruction. Obedience is submission to an authority. Obedience is doing what the command says you must do. And so for Christianity today, we can't be beating about the bush here and we can't be kind of looking at this particular text from a distance because in actual fact, the act of baptism symbolizes your repentance and your being born again and coming out in newness of life. That's the, what it symbolizes. It's not going to save you. And so because that's Christian doctrine, a lot of people stand back and say, well, do I have to be baptized to be saved? Well, of course, we don't find that in the scriptures at all. And so we'll tell you, no, you don't. Well, then why do I have to be baptized? Because Jesus himself got baptized. And if we to be followers of Jesus, then we need to find out, well, why was it so important for Jesus to be baptized? And so here we go to the next verse that I'm wanting to look at. Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee, this is the Great Commission, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Go therefore, Great Commission, remember, and make disciples of all nations, look at this, baptizing them, immersing them, plunging them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, and behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. So the Great Commission isn't about going just to describe Jesus dying on the cross and then rising again from the dead, which we know to be the gospel. It's those two components, Jesus dying for us. It's not the will of God that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. When Jesus, speaking to Nicodemus, says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that word gave is someone needed to pay the price because the wages of sin is death, and all of us were born into sin and all of us therefore needed to know that we were not in relationship with God. And so how do you do that? How do you become in relationship with God? Well, then you need to be born again. There needs to be that regeneration of spirit. And as you step into that moment, you're born again. And so now what? 
Well, now there's something about Jesus saying, well, why don't you follow me through the waters of baptism? But Jesus, you were perfect. There was no sin in you. And then what you have to do is go back and follow the storyline and just realize, oh, but the prophet said that he'd be like a lamb led to the slaughter. Oh, but the prophet said that, my goodness, this man was innocent and yet he's the one that's gonna be slain. So even in the words of our song this morning, when we sing about slain and risen king, well, that's Jesus. When he came into Jerusalem, they were waving, they were singing Hosanna to the king. It wasn't quite the king that they expected or wanted. They wanted someone to come in a shining armor. No, this was Jesus, the humble servant. And so what happens is Jesus then takes the punishment of our sin upon himself on the cross. And that's why he cries out and he says, why have you forsaken me? Because God can't look on sin. So just in that moment, Jesus is having this lonely moment on the cross. And that's the pain of it. That's what hell is all about. It's separation from God in that moment. And then the Bible says, but God was in Christ raising him from the dead. That's the power story that we embrace. And so when it comes to all of what it is that we're looking at right here, Jesus, the great commission, he says, now go and baptize them. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so the Muslims will look at us and they'll say, oh yeah, you guys are polytheistic, you believe in three gods. But they don't understand that even Paul, when he writes about the Godhead, and he writes about this very thing which we call now the Trinity, he says it's a mystery that you've got three and one, and you've got one and three. And so if it's a mystery, initially it's not gonna make any sense. But as you come into the Christian faith, and as you subject yourself to the washing of the water of the word, and as you devote yourself to, to doctrine, then you'll realize, oh no, actually, all along, that's how God represented himself, in three persons, all along. So you've got these two words. You've got Jehovah, which is the self-existent one. And then you've got in the beginning, God. And as you look through that Genesis chapter one, and eventually it comes to, and God decided that he was gonna create man. Suddenly now you see the word Elohim is used to describe God. And that is, again, plural. The fact that you've even got the word, let us, who's the us? Well, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so what you've got here, you've got this incredible moment where we've been baptized in the very name of God. It becomes just for me something that is, this is not just about following a religious ritual. This isn't just about, oh, great, baptism Sunday. We're all gonna get baptized now, so let's just go and get wet. No, 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 this is something else. This is about you understanding that your baptism is as Jesus came up out of the tomb and rose resurrection life. He wasn't resuscitated. Sometimes people think that. Oh, he just fainted. No, he wasn't just revived. No, he was resurrected. The power of God raised him from the dead. And so that's what we're looking at. And then he walks in this new life. He wasn't this bodiless creature. We're not gonna be bodiless into the disembodied spirits. No, 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 you're gonna look like you for the rest of eternity. <laughs> we're gonna have the same body that Jesus had when he rose again from the dead. Everybody identified him. Oh, yeah, that's Jesus for sure. And so that's for me, there's a power factor here. And so while John, the baptizer, what he's doing is wakening the consciences of individuals. And he's simply saying, just because you're Abraham's children doesn't mean that all is well for you. You need to repent. So he's laying bare the hearts and he's letting them know you're a corrupt community, a corrupt generation, you need to repent. And so let's look at Jesus' baptism. Jesus arrives on the scene and he identifies Jesus. Remember they're cousins. He sees Jesus and he says to them, ah, oh, this is the one that I spoke about, the one coming after me that's not only gonna baptize, he's gonna baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. This, this is the man. I'm not worthy to tie his shoelaces here, not at all. Jesus, you should be baptizing me. And then Jesus says this, and this for me is very powerful. He says, no, for all righteousness to be fulfilled, I need to identify with the sins of humanity. And that's what I'm doing. Because I'm gonna take the punishment of the sins of humanity, which is death. I'm gonna take that punishment on the cross. But right now, I need to identify with the sinner. And so, baptize me. Isn't that incredible? And then heaven's open. Jesus had done nothing. He hadn't begun his ministry, nothing. And from heaven, you don't hear Jesus, this is your new assignment. 
No, this is what you hear. Well done, my good and faithful son. That's it, that's what Jesus hears, this echo from heaven. And then it says, and the Holy Spirit enlightened upon him. That's why baptism is important, is because Jesus did it. So what we're doing is, Jesus identified with us because we're sinners. So baptism simply says, right now I'm identifying with my Savior who was buried, who died, rose again from the dead. I'm identifying with him. I'm identifying with Jesus. I'm in Jesus' team from here. How does that sound? It should. There are three different baptisms that the Bible preaches or speaks about. And this morning I really just wanted to stay with the one and that is the one of water baptism. And the reason why I say that is because many of you haven't been water baptized. And we have a baptismal time service moment at the end of next week's meeting. And I'm really wanting to nudge you, urge you, say, have a look at the scriptures and be there. We wanna celebrate that moment with you as you identify. It's not something that you can do behind closed doors. A baptism was to be a witness. It had to carry with it the testimony of yes, I've been born again and people need to know that I'm one of those who's standing for Christ. Now, I can understand in the underground church, and I know this to be true, baptisms happen, but there's always a public witness, always. There needs to be a witness to your baptism. Can't do it secretly, no secret disciples. And so my urge to you this morning is we've sung theology, we've enjoyed praise, we've looked at what the Word of God says. We cannot allow what institutionalized church has actually dumped on people who are sincere, even using sincere Christian that simply was a distortion and it sucked people into it and they begin to read. What did they read about? Just read about Greek mythology, Roman mythology. And in fact, then they begin to borrow from here. They begin to pattern their lives. There's no life in this. There's only bondage and it needed Martin Luther to protest about that. And then of course, we've got the progression of the church from Martin Luther's time until now where truth has been restored. And the church is more powerful today than it was then. Why? Because we're carrying knowledge, we're carrying information. My people are destroyed because of lack of knowledge. That's what the Bible says. And so that's why it's vital that you and I at least know the basics. We're familiar with just Christianity 101. Why are we baptized? Well, I'm able to go to the scripture and show you why. Jesus identified with me and I'm identifying with him. And as I come up out of that water, I'm being obedient to what it is that he commissioned going to all the world, baptizing them, teaching them the gospel. How are you doing this morning? <laughs> Come on, why don't you stand? Why don't you stand? <clears throat> Next week, I wanna speak about immersion into the body of Christ. Very interesting subject. And then I also wanna speak about being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Very exciting, who's excited about that? <laughs> Absolutely. Father, we, we wanna be a church that loves your word. We wanna be a church that loves Jesus. And if Jesus said it, yes, we believe it. God, you've shown us, you've proved yourself faithful. We, we don't doubt that. We don't ever wanna doubt it into our future either. We wanna know that we can stand continually trusting God. The way we represent you, Father, we're asking that we would just polish up. <laughs> we would just make sure that yes, indeed, we, we're not gonna be half-baked. We're not gonna compromise. You know, we say we're Christians, but in actual fact, when people look at us, they don't really see the, the virtues and the values of the Christianity that's described in the New Testament. So Father, we're asking that indeed, we, we just become a little more alert to what it is that you're doing in the world today. With the conflict that we have in Europe, with the nations at the moment just living in anxiety, where you've got mental health that has just become a reality. People don't read the Bible and if they had, they would see that you said that men's hearts would fail them for fear of what's happening on the earth. And, and we're in those times right now. People are just afraid. People are murdering fetuses. God, it's so essential that we know what it is that we believe. So Father, I pray this over us. 
then indeed we will be able to give an account of the hope that's in us. We will be able to give a testimony, a powerful testimony that you are in so that people can be lured, can be invited into this wonderful story, the Jesus story, the God story. Holy Spirit, would you enable us right now? Kind of just feel that we've been calling up onto parade right now. Just in a military context, we're hearing that voice from heaven, get on parade, which simply means that we march in a formation to be inspected. And as we're inspected, Father, let there be no blemish within us. Nothing wrong with the weapons that we carry. They're clean. We know what they are. We know our own authority in you. Holy Spirit, just fill us again, once again, with your power, with your wisdom. And yes, God, the fire of God. Yes, Lord, we do pray for that. Pray for authentic, real Christianity. We ask for that in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you, Cameron. Thanks, Ash. Can we just